a lot of design is theoretical. Is someone wondering how psychology has an impact on design? Anyone? See, the, the, to some extent, we can create layouts, we can create spacing, you can have colors, you can have white, white space. But when you reach design reaches a certain point, it, it tends to touch a subconscious level. At that time, the users they form assumptions and they have impressions based on them. These are not necessarily conscious decisions. They are at a subconscious level, and they don't have a Gutenberg theory. Okay, anyone else? Based off him. So uh, Arnav said, if, if the app you're using doesn't match the rest of the system, it irritates you. So if I give you an iOS app on an Android platform, perfectly compatible with it. How many of you like the bottom tabs on Google Plus? No. So Google Plus just introduced tabs at the bottom. Yeah, this is an iOS design pattern. They're experimenting with it on Android. But 80% of feedback they received was negative. Why are you bring an iOS pattern to Android? It's some psychological impact. It doesn't have a real usability impact. In fact, it's easier to use because the tabs are easier to access. But it doesn't fit with the rest of the system, right? So coming back to does anyone heard of Gutenberg theory? No? So Gutenberg theory states that if you on any screen, if you draw a Z, the alphabet Z. So from the starting four, four points where you touch the vertices, that is how users look at any screen. They start at the top left, then, go, then they go to the top right, then the bottom left, and then the bottom right. Now again, this is not something they consciously do. It happens at a very subconscious primal level. Color theory, everyone knows color theory? The theory that colors have certain emotions behind them. Red is excitement, blue is reliability. Again, not a conscious decision, a subconscious one. Okay, UX metrics. Anyone, how do you, how do you say an app has a good UX? Okay, so if your app meets your expectations from anyone else? Music keeps coming back to it. Okay, anyone else? Interactive. Has anyone heard of Google's Heart system? They have a system called H E A R T. It basically measures UX in terms of happiness. So when a user uses the app, they should, it's, not, it's not just about function. It's about making the user actually happy to use something. It's about engagement, like someone said, it's still coming back. It's about adoption. What makes an app stand out from its competitors? If two apps are doing exactly the same, but one has a phenomenal way of doing it, one has a very basic way of doing it. Adoption factors in. Retention. What if your screenshots are on Google Play are amazing, your description is amazing, but when I download it and I use it the first time, I don't come back. Retaining is also one met metric for UX and task success. For example, if I'm going to create an email okay, in Gmail, what, how, what revolution brought about the floating action button in material design? You had to create an email. Every time you open the app, you reach all the way to the top of the screen and click the email button. Now, with phones like the Nexus 6 coming out, it's really tough action for a really simple task. Again, the floating action button was introduced just to improve UX. Now, another thing that users subconsciously do is they form a mental model of an app. They don't know they're doing this, but when, as they use the app and as they have interactions with it and as animations play and as colors fill in, they form a mental model in which they have a certain idea of where things are in an app, how things will, how things will react if touched, how, what things act in certain ways. For example, if you have a list of cards, okay? now on Google, Google Plus, okay, you have a list of cards. You also have the same kind of cards in the notification drawer. But one of them swipes and one of them doesn't. The user is expecting both to swipe because they're the same type of thing in the same app. Right? So priority in the user's mental model. 
how many of you have been actually been interrupted by an alert dialog or the industry deal ads that come up? No, you all love ads. I mean, f as a developer, yes, as users. So priority. If you have something in a mental model right on the top, for example, an alert dialog when you fire up Google Maps, it tells you to turn on GPS. It's right at the top. This is the highest priority item. Hierarchy. You have the navigation drawer. Now, if you read the, the material design guidelines, you see it's at the highest level, even above the action bar now. Again, this is something that forms in the user's mental model because if you have the screens within an app, and think about it from not as from an app, okay, if you have sheets of paper and you have something that is higher at all, than all of them, it's from one that you go to another, not from, from the smaller ones that you go to the bigger one. Pre Lollipop, the navigation drawer it was below the toolbar. And that didn't work psychologically because it didn't make sense. So going from a lower level to a higher level, and then back to a lower level, it doesn't work. Structure. So again, this comes, this comes under navigation hierarchy and expectations, which is how I spoke about cards in Google Plus. Can you tell me now, mental model, which is a form of an app? Any app you remember using, which you know it meets your expectations and you think it has a phenomenal UX. Someone answer? Okay, what do you like in Gmail? Have you ever predicted something and you it has happened? Okay, what may you predict swipe to delete? It's it's a sub subconscious level, right? So Cortana wants to listen. Slight delay. Can anyone keep app examples flowing? Apps which have used which have met your expectations and which you think have a good UX, but you can't pinpoint why. Now he said Gmail because it has five to delete, which he predicted without actually knowing it existed. Anyone else? Okay. What about it do you love so much? Okay. Okay, you like Relay for Reddit. Anyone else? Timely is good UX. Now, let's go closer to the topic we came for. The three axes in material design. Now, before material design, when we had hollow and the droid design styles, layouts were only along the x and y axis. Now, this, it worked, it worked for many years, but then when you apps got more complex and there's more navigation, there's more hierarchy within them, it doesn't work because you have the thing, are different hierarchies, they have different priorities. You need a more complex structure. And Olipop introduced the z axis, which Basically, yeah, this is something like this. So Z axis works on a 3D scale and it introduced the material design world that brought the Z axis along with it. So basically on our hand, on our phones, with on our hands, you have a material design world. That world doesn't have just height, it doesn't have just length and breadth, it has height. And objects can lay along the Z axis and they can have diff different thicknesses, they can have different elevations within the world. And it worked, it made apps more complex in a good way, not in a bad way. For example, if you have the navigation drawer. Now, even in hollow, it used to have a small shadow on the right side of it. Um, it, it felt right. Nobody knew why at that time. Google just recommended it in the guidelines. Here's a nine patch, just throw it next to the drawer. It was right there in the guidelines. People followed it blindly, but they didn't think, why are they doing it? There was a hint of it back then that the drawer is at a higher level than the rest of the content. So then, yeah, Rolibar actually made it concrete. So the, now, again, coming back to a subconscious level. 
what do these axes actually imply? So the x and y axis, let's take tabs, tabs on Google Play, tabs in newsstand, they are all on the x axis, right? Any other pattern you see lies along the x axis? Okay, you pages. Word. I'm not talking about views that lie along the x-axis. We have view pages and tabs as examples. So when excuse me, sliders, right? So when elements are tend to be ordered on the x-axis, they usually have they present the user the, the image that they're at the same level of priority. The same works for y-axis, but the y-axis also works in terms of you know as you swipe, either it becomes older or it goes at a higher level. But the z-axis is what actually makes it complex because the closer you are to the user, is the more higher priority. That's why dialogues and the floating action button get the highest elevation of the entire Android system because they're the most important actions that come with it. So, now animations, animations have been around for a long time, right? Does anyone remember when web animations came into play? Early 2000s, CSS3 has brought made it a lot more, but web and JavaScript animations were there since a lot longer. So animations have been around for a long time, and if you bring animations to the Android platform, they tend to improve the sense of hierarchy that the user has in the way they move, the speed they move at, the way they move and they stop and they move again. But that all that doesn't work with material design. Let's take a quick example to see what. I'm, how many of you have seen this on? There was this animation making the round on Google Plus a while back. Has anyone come across it? Yeah. So uh, you have a floating action button there. You have a toolbar. Does it work with material design? Okay. Someone thinks it's funny. Can anyone tell me? Does this animation work with material design? Would you use it? So you're saying no, but then why? It looks pretty and got a lot of plus ones. But does it make sense? In the world of material design, yeah. Okay, someone mentioned about accent color. Does that is that, is that the reason you wouldn't use it? I mean you could just change the color and use it. Would you use this animation? Yeah. Same level of hierarchy. No. Think about it this way. Material design, the world exists in two, two elements, paper and ink. Okay. But can paper actually contract, form a random shape, and then again go and form a square? Elements are paper, and a text and icons are ink. So can paper actually do this? It can do simple morphing. You can do this level of complex morphing and then actually go and bounce on top. No, it doesn't fit into material design. Another example. Okay, yeah. Again, you have a floating action button. It looks really amazing in the animation. Most users would be delighted by it. But it messes around at the subconscious level in which the yellow color paper which is composed composed the floating action button. It ripples and it becomes into ink. It ripples are ink. Again, it doesn't work with material design. While it may be delightful, it doesn't work. It causes a lot of subconscious complications. Now, what then what exactly makes you can't just say that you know if paper stays paper, it makes material animation. The two more things. The laws of physics in the material design world. Now, when my Google design team introduced the material design world, it was not just about paper and ink. It also had physics in it. Now can I tell you why? What was the point of adding physics to material design? It feels natural. Used to it and sense of it. Yeah. So basically, what happens when a user opens an app or they come across in this term a new design language, there's a learning curve which they take to actually get familiarized with it. 
what is the, the, the design elements in the learning in, in that design language? They are similar to the real world, which you interact with every day. It makes things a lot more simple. The learning curve is reduced a lot, and everything is just easier to adapt to. So, uh, if three animations on the same floating action button, you can tell me which works and which doesn't. No, no, you have to tell me what. I mean, you can't just the third one, first one. Okay, which doesn't work? Who said second one totally doesn't work? You know, you know everything. Is Okay. 3D motion on 2D object. Interesting. What if the 3D motion was not there? Okay. What if it was in a view pager? You're swiping the view pager and then this icon is swiping away. Would it work then? Is it? If you have a sheet of paper and you have ink on it, can ink slide off the paper? We are not that technologically advanced yet. Does it work? No. I'm choosing between the first and the third. Which of these don't work? Material design paradigm allows that. But it doesn't allow ink just going away out. Ink going and coming is fine, but it can't slide out of the, its constraints. You can take different shapes, that's how I can't remember. So, for the first and third one both work. Now, this is where the delight factor comes into play. Both these animations are perfect for use. In fact, apps use both versions. Very few people actually go through the pains of creating that because it's a process of going in after effects. Getting a frame animation, getting 60 PNGs, and then there is a Java way, but there will be So, this is where the light comes into play. Both animations work. But what happens is you will see that morphing the first time. You're going to want to know how it's done. They're going to know how exactly that a pencil changed to a tick mark. So, they tend to press it a couple of times. And if something delights you uses in an app, so if, for example, someone here loved the timely implementation of changing the time. Some people, anyone else, anything that's delighted you in an app, I like Timely's background. It's really amazing. Yeah, people love that. And, and I remember people were furious when Google said that no, it's not allowed. You have to put the tool navigation bar above the toolbar. People were actually furious and they were rebelling that no, we want it below because you just want to see that animation. Oh, the sales one, right? Okay. You see, another thing is, as a developer, you cannot just say that it's an app by Google, and I, if I copy them, the design is perfect, because the spec sheet is what is right. That, that may not always transform into perfect applications by Google, because there are a lot of different teams working on it. And these teams like to experiment with things. Like, for example, I mentioned the bottom tabs in Google Plus. They don't work, they're absolutely against material design guidelines. But then Google teams like to experiment. So you cannot use Google Apps as a benchmark that if they do it, I can do it. Now, for, for a long time, Hangouts. How many of you use Hangouts? How many of you remember for a long time it was half hollow and half material? <laughs> and what a disaster that was. So you cannot use Google Apps as a benchmark for that. So, okay, um, he, he mentioned the hamburger to arrow animation, he mentioned timely. Any, anything else actually delighted you. It could have been done simpler, but people took the pains to do it in a more delightful way. Any memories? Okay, WhatsApp's attach button. Yeah, that caused an amazing revolution of FSC. What? Okay, what does Evernote do? It morphs into a toolbar, right? It morphs into a toolbar.
everyone does that inbox does it too right the same thing so everyone actually uh, the reason I confused was everyone had a concept design where the same floating action button the paper morphed into a toolbar at the bottom with three options in it and also people love that any any other apps okay Tumblr loves to experiment way outside constraints. How many of you have used Nick Butcher's Plaid application? So few? Yeah. It's pronounced Plaid. Fine. I mean, he's British and he's British will pronounce it Plaid. Nick Butcher's Plaid application, then we used it. How many of you know who Nick Butcher is? Okay, anyway, he did a Google Plus post the other day wherein he takes a search icon and when it's clicked, he morphs the entire XVG into a search line, the text, text field at the bottom. Now, he was mentioning in a podcast that it took him a three whole days to do that whole, you know, take the whole process from creating an After Effects and then convert it to a Java animation for better performance. Now, it wasn't much of a difference because it's like a basic a 300 millisecond animation, but it's really delightful to the extent where someone went and made a library out of it. An entire Android library just for that one view, search to text feed. Okay. Does this animation work? Yes, no. Would you implement this animation? I think I have to ask that before I ask yes or no. Would you implement it? I am talking exactly like this, no modification. Would you? Okay, just take for example the view page of swiping. Would you implement that? So we have many yeses and one no. Why? No, 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 I'm just talking about the swiping animation. Would you put it in your app? Yeah, so that's some people have got it right. Paper does not bounce. Okay, this is a bouncing interpolator wherein there's a little overshoot and it comes back to its original position. It is it's a very small thing, but doesn't conform to guidelines. And what are like Adam said, when a, an app goes outside the constraint, the action where is painfully visible. It doesn't good, provide a good psychological impression on the user. What about the, the circular reveal? Would you use that? Yeah? Perfect, right? It, everything about it is perfect? No. There are four important. It's okay, I like Tumblr too. Okay. There are four important things that come up, important factors that come to mind when creating animations of material design. First of them is duration. You know, animations can either be too, too short and then they, they really distractions, or they can be so long to the point where you keep your phone aside and you do something else and the animation is over. Okay. Now, give me random animation times which you would, you would use. Everyone's implemented animations in, the, in their app, right? View pages. XML animations, Java animation. What animation durations do you use? 200, 300 milliseconds. Okay. 500 milliseconds. Okay. 800. I can download an app on a 4G connection in that much time. Anyone else? What anyone use? How many of you have implemented animations in your app? 300. Okay. I'm taking a step back. And then now, what durations have we used? 300? Yeah. So, since if the thing is, everyone goes and 300, 400, 500 till something feels right. But then, since API level 3, Google has provided three default values. 
for animation long, animation short, and animation medium. And there is API level three, but then half people don't know about them. Why go to the extent of trying testing something that feels right? And Google actually done extensions testing and already added it into the API. Doesn't make sense. Now, let's look at one quick animation. I found this in Material Lab. Okay, it's it's really well well done. But now is the timing right? The drop should be really much faster. I mean, it it takes too long. It doesn't feel right. How much milliseconds drop would you apply on this? If you were implementing this animation, what duration would you do for the drop? This is the point where you say you've just described the three three durations, and I'm going to use the short one or the medium one, but use the default the origin point. Now, on material design, you have obviously you have fading and fading in and fading out, but things tend to seem more natural when they come from a certain origin. How many of you watch the material design reel shown on IO? Material design reel shown at Google IO 2014. You can reduce material design. Really? You didn't watch Google I/O? Okay. It's an interesting event. Right? Check it out sometime. Okay. So you have an action over there in the corner, and then you have a car that appears because of your action. Now again, this is, is a delight factor. If I, I can, I can certainly fade in the car when the thing is clicked. But if you actually make it grow out, it makes the user know that it comes coming from there. It's directly related to the action, and it has it has a sense of structure around it. It's not just appearing randomly out of nowhere because something somewhere else was clicked. It's coming from a point of origin. Another quick example. You can see this animation. Okay, someone said error. Why? Someone said error. Right? Yes. Yes, wrong, red switches look wrong. But there's another point of it. The point was the point of origin of the animation. Now, how many of you use the clock app on on Android? It has the crossfade in the background. You know when you, the time of the day changes, the background color changes, crossfade matches the time of the day. And you could have used the crossfade animation over here to work perfectly, wouldn't it? Okay. How many of you have dialed a number on an on Android phone? Simpler question. Everyone, I'm still not getting unanimous yes. Okay, for those of you who have not answered, the phones are more than playing Candy Crush. Okay. Now, when you when you dial a number on an Android phone, you have a blue color ripple coming out from the contact where you click. Okay. It may it makes a certain sense because you can't have the ripple coming from the center. It doesn't make sense. You can't have it coming from any random place on the skin. Goes again. It doesn't make sense. But if you have it from where the touch action originated. It tells the user that okay, this is the contact I click. But even if a few milliseconds later the user realizes that it, it, I was looking somewhere else, but the animation started from there, you can realize they dialed the wrong number by mistake, right? I'm not getting unanimous answers here. You feel that there's a different opinion on this? Okay, it wouldn't work because your point of origin animation is really important. Telling the user what triggered it and how it's going to react. How many of you have used Google Play games? No, no Google Play games users. We have like four or five. Okay. So when you take an avatar, and let's take a step back to the real world. If things were you're going from play. Now this is not involving Bangalore traffic. Okay. But if you're going from place A to place B, okay, would you go in a linear fashion, absolutely straight? Again, Bangalore the traffic does not factor in over here. That's just a nightmare. Would you go linearly from point A to point B as the crow flies? Really? I mean, through buildings and everything? You wouldn't, right? You're not going to take a straight path from point A to point B. Th things in the real, and even if you do, when I was walking to the other side of the stage, I would not take an exact straight path. Like it or not, I would vary a little, even a few centimeters off. When objects are moving from point A to point B on the screen in material design, having them move straight across the screen 
doesn't seem natural because that's not how objects work. But having them move, move around a parabolic path, something like this. If you have your Android phones out, fire up Google Play games and click on the avatar over there. It provides a really beautiful animation. So the avatar moves from one part of the screen to the next screen and follows the parabolic path. Now again, this is it's it's about conformity to material design. Animation on a straight part would work. So if you wanted to fit with the rest of the system, you wanted to feel constrained with the material design world, and you want to make it seem natural to the user where they have a slow learning curve, a fast learning curve, this is what you need to do. How many of you have heard of interpolation? Well, again, I come back. How many of you have implemented an animation in your app? Okay. Have you seen the Java class for adding interpolation? And if you tried it, has anyone not tried it? <laughs> There's only one honest person over here. He's not tried interpolation. So interpolation in, in mathematical terms, it's about creating a new set of values within a given set of ones. How does this apply to animation? Now, if, if you were driving a car, uh, uh, come back to the real world, which is where material design finds all its roots. If you were driving a car from point A to point B, would you be at a constant speed throughout the journey? At the same time, if you see, uh, you're watching a movie, and you see an actor coming in. Is he going to slow down at the start of the screen and then uh, speed up and then again slow down towards the end? No, he comes in linearly and then slows down. What about someone walking off the screen? Do they slow down as they reach the end? No, they start, accelerate, and then go, go off linearly. Let's look at how that applies to, to animation. Now, that's how linear animations look. And that's how material design animation should look. Does it not feel more natural to have its speed and then go? This is what interpolation is. Basically, you, you have a certain values. Animations are made up of keyframes. You know that, right? Keyframes are certain states within the animation itself. If you just shuffle those around a little and make it accelerate and accelerate at certain points, it makes it seem less linear and less robotic in nature and more natural in, in tandem with the real world. Again, I don't see people agreeing with this. Do you like to do the red one? Do you like to do the green one? Or do you? Yes. Are you sure? What about this? Mm -hmm. Extremes are not slow. Not smooth. That's because it's disappearing over there. So you wanted to slow down towards the ending. So you mean if I was exiting this hall, if Karthik puts off, off again, I think I'd have to. If I was exiting this hall, would I slow down near the door? I mean, I'm not hoping someone calls me back, but would I slow down? I won't slow down, right? This is how views work in material design. They're not going to slow down as they enter in the frame because they have no reason to. They're going away out. This, this is seen natural. What about now? Just because it's red doesn't mean it's wrong. But what about this is wrong? I think this is your apply. No, can you see this, the slight curves over here at the bottom? It's not a straight line. That slight curve is where this slows down towards the end. This is, is, is wrong, totally wrong because views do not go to the, the end and then slow down. It feels like the phone is lagging, which is, is a really important thing. We do not want to have phone. It's one of the worst user experience for a phone to I mean, lag a little bit. Would you implement a design like that? I mean, you would. Would you? Okay. Okay. Green is preferred. Yeah, because the green is the right animations. And red is wrong. I talked about color psychology in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, they are different. There are four different animations over there. Okay. 
How many of you work with Lollipops APIs? Uh, how many of you are still working on gingerbread APIs? It's a lot of fun. Lollipop APIs? Have you heard of activity transition? I mean, they were there earlier also, but they were, um, they were 2D constructs, right? I mean, you had a gingerbread design, the activity would just move away and then another one would come. And they were a little better than KitKat, but not really good. But now coming to Lollipop and you have everything in a paper and ink world, can things just appear like this? Or can you have a, a transition that does not work? What is the default animation Lollipop? Then you know, you open apps all day, right? Slides up in the bottom. Anything else you've noticed? Okay, it looks like it's at a higher level than the earlier one. Why? Okay, so when uh, activity is launched in, in Android Lollipop and you have not configured any anima animation, the default one comes up from the bottom and looks slightly higher because the one in the background fades a little bit. Now, when that fades and this comes out with a shadow, with a shadow on top, it makes it look like it's at a higher level in the hierarchy and the previous one is thinking behind. Now, this may not be very significant, but you have noticed it, right? Because the, the new one is at a higher level in the hierarchy, it's more important, and the old one is gone, it's in the past. Can activities change without an animation? If you were to override and provide null values to the on override pending activity tra transition, would it work? It would work in Java, would it work in design? Can you have a sheet of paper with ink on it, just randomly transition to a new one without any form of visual relationship between the two? Yes, no? Okay. What about shared elements? How many of you actually implemented them? None? One? Really? Two? How many of you have seen them in action? Okay, the rest of you have you not seen them or do you not know what they are? Not getting any answers. Right. Okay, so if you would rather not code it. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys realize even if you don't answer, you cannot go and watch Star Wars tonight, right? It's not launched in India. You have to be here for the next some time. And that's doing other interesting thing happening outside. Shared element transitions provide every one of the gestalt principles. This is something called visual continuity. If the user sees an action, for example, Arna mentioned, milk bottles coming in on the menu and then going to the scooter to the scart at the bottom. If that thing, imagine that is not there, okay, and the user for 300 to 400 milliseconds looking at some unrelated animation. I mean, like I mentioned before, there's an active transition where one is fading in, the other is sliding up, but is it related to the items on the screen? No. If you have a shared element where something is actually changing position, with respect to its new, new place on screen. Google Play. Has everyone used Google Play, I hope? Or are there some re rebels using Amazon App Store? No? Okay. So on Google Play, when you click on an item in the grid, the icon comes out and becomes a little larger, and the things are the fade. Now, it's sense of continuity, because otherwise you would be looking at a scene coming up from the bottom, and the entire bottom space would be wasted. The user would look away. But when the icon actually fades, the user is so busy looking at it, they don't realize when the rest of the content is loaded around it. The contrast is a little bad, but yeah. So you have a whole list of rows. Okay, phone app. Have you used the phone app? You've seen when you click an item and it comes up a little bit, shadow down. This is kind of what it is, only thing it becomes a new activity. The entire row transitions to a new screen. Otherwise, it's a visual continuity, right? It's not just a random thing coming up from the bottom, it's related directly to the previous one. Okay. How many of you have seen the Cordelline video, the material design, infamous one? I think it's what made people fall in love with material design. Has anyone not watched this before? Everyone watched it, right? No, okay. Shared elements aside, has you notice anything in the fab when it transitions to a new thing? 
Okay, like how many things that I talked about today do you notice in that? Someone said parabola curve. Interpolation. Do you see it slowing down towards the end? Slows on as it becomes a part of the slider. What else? Okay, morphing. You said morphing, right? Yeah. What else? People start from point of origin. Okay, what else? Nothing else you notice. Okay, text fades away. This is the capital of material design animation. Like everything that is right about animation is implemented in this few milliseconds. What else do you notice? We have fading, we have interpolation. Does it? This is a really important factor. Does it change? I mean, the floating action point is aimed at a higher level. It just slides down. And the floating action point is at an even higher elevation. That slides over it. So when the fab transitions from one place to the other, it maintains its z-axis. Because, because what does the floating action button signify? The most important part of the screen, right? So when it becomes a now playing section, it, it's not a fab anymore, but it still maintains the fab elevation because, like I said, it's the most important part of the screen. Sure, album art looks pretty, but yeah, now playing is important. Another thing that factors in your Google Play games, if you notice. You have the avatar transitioning, it's perfect, parabola curve is perfect. But there's no shadows over there. So you have two sheets of paper, you have a circle which is moving from one to the other, with no shadow. Theoretically, can that paper do that? If it's elevating above sheet one, it needs a shadow. Then it needs a parabolic curve for the new one. Right? Okay, takeaways from this. Things you need to ask yourself when designing. Okay, one more point. How much time do I have? Done? Five minutes? Okay. Is it, is it, I have a one minute to describe this. This is really important. How many of you love this animation? It's beautiful, right? Karthik is looking at the watch. Please say it's beautiful. Is it? But how many of you don't like it? You don't like it? <laughs> okay. Is it useful? I mean, how point is it to animate an icon? But even if it's not long, it's animating an icon. And icon will animate. This is not design, this is art. Like, what about this? You have a relatively long thing happening, the thing transforming. Is it pointless? All the while you're doing this, the fingerprint sensor in the background is authenticating your fingerprint. Is it kind of the same animation? It is not pointless because it's not blocking the user from interacting. It's doing something in the background. So if you find the right balance between good animation, which is actually useful, but not to the extent where you really imagine it, imagination take over and becomes totally pointless, it's hampering the entire user experience. So, we wrap up. So, so skip all this. Yeah, so feel free to get in touch with me.